You know, so often in our lives, uh, we find ourselves in a place where we feel like we're, we're really under attack. Like there's an enemy out there after us and things just don't go right. There's turmoil in our hearts. You know, they're, they're, they're just things that, that seemingly don't add up. And, and I think we all find ourselves in those positions from time to time. But it, and it's really easy when you find ourselves in that position to, to kind of place blame and to say, well, you know, the devil's attacking me. He, he's, he's my enemy. And yes, he is your enemy. He is an, an enemy. But we also find that in the scripture in Romans chapter 8, verses 5, 6, and 7, that the Bible says that the carnal mind, the flesh, and our soul sometimes come together in a way. And those things, when they are um, under the sway of the world, become an enemy to God. And sometimes in our lives, we, we're not necessarily facing the, the attack of the devil as much as we are just facing the enemy within so we did, started this series a couple weeks ago called The Enemy Within, and it's really a series designed to, to help us to, to figure out, like, what is it on the inside that needs to be refreshed, that needs to be renewed? What is it that's happening in our, our emotions or our will or, or our fleshly desires that is turning into an enemy? And, and you guys all know this. Like, there are times in your life when there's things that just come out of you, and you're like, I have no idea where that came from. How, how did that happen? I have a two-year-old, so I have to be really careful about what comes out of me. I was riding in the car with someone last week, and I will not mention any names, no one related to me with DNA. And we were just talking, and the person said, yeah, you know, that the guy was just so stupid. And Hudson's like, stupid, stupid. And so my friend is like, he's like, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. And he's like, hey, buddy, don't say that. And Hudson's like, that's stupid. And like every time we ask him, like, hey, man, that's probably not good to say. It's bad for your heart. He just goes more and more and more, right? So uh, we all have those things. They just kind of come out of us from time to time. Now, that's not necessarily an enemy that, you know, saying the word stupid is not going to hurt you. But let me tell you something. When you have a regular diet of those things feeding inside of you that, that are digested by your soul and spirit and they come back out and they cut your spouse, that is an enemy. When you have those things that, that the sway of the world is putting in you and you digest them and they, they come back out under moments of stress and, and you waylay your children verbally, that is an enemy. When you find yourself alone and, and you're feeling depressed and, and there's, there's this desire that's calling you to, to, to get up and, and, and go medicate your pain, that is an enemy. And so there is an, an enemy within us. And when I opened this series last week or two weeks ago, uh, I, I gave you two things. We, we talked about arresting, arresting the thoughts that happen inside of our, our mind. But the other word that I told you to write down two weeks ago was investing, arresting and investing. And I want to talk to you today uh, around this idea of how to invest in the spirit side of you so that when the soul or the flesh side of you decides it wants to take over, you, the real you, the eternal you, the spiritual you is stronger than the physical or the carnal you. Uh, when I was uh, in college, I had an opportunity to go to Duke University and, and do an internship. And for those of you who are new, don't know, I was a research chemist. And so I got to go to Duke and I was working in the Department of Anesthesiology. And I, I was really hurt in church. I'd been dating a pastor's uh, niece and people had meddled. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't meddle. Had meddled. And so I ended up breaking the relationship off. And I was in a place where I was like, I'm looking for like the person I'm going to marry. You know, this wasn't just playing around. And so I was really hurt because they, they had been meddling. And so I went to this internship in Duke, at Duke University, and I got there, you know, weeks before the rest of the, the interns, and, and I was by myself, and um, I'd been working on staff at a church. I helped a, a friend of mine plant a church. I mean, I had dedicated my life to Jesus, and in a weak moment of being alone, uh, I went to the gas station, filled up with gas, and I got the biggest bottle of Colt 45 that I could find, and, and I... I just got stupid drunk. And it opened a door for a season while I was at this university um, for me to begin to, to take steps in a direction that was an enemy of God's purpose and calling for my life. And I'll never forget, swing dancing was big at the time. You guys remember when swing dancing was big? No, anyone? 
It's not that long ago, guys. I mean, come on. Swing dancing was big. And, and I, because I was, had been hurt in church and ministry, which, by the way, if you've been hurt, welcome to family because family hurts each other. But that's just the way it is. We heal. We knock off the rough edges, and God does a work in us. And we learn from it. We laugh at it, and we move on from it. So that hurt set me up in a position that taught me one of the biggest lessons of my life. So don't discount the purpose that exists in your pain. So anyway, I'm, I'm here, and um, swing dancing was big. And, and so I, you know, I'm meeting these folks, and there was this girl. And her dad was a physician in the Department of Anesthesiology. And uh, she was uh, thinking about going to medical school. And I was thinking about going to medical school. And um, I hated to dance. She liked to dance. And so I ended up swing dancing a lot for the first few weeks that I was there. And, um, yeah, it was really bad. And um, I, I remember that there was a, a moment where on the inside of me, my spirit rose up and spoke to my soul in such a way that was so clear. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget how my spirit in a place where I was making decisions that were taking me down a path that God had not ordained for my life, my spirit stepped up in a moment of strength and said, you cannot date this girl and you cannot go this direction. If you do, it will be an enemy of God's destiny for your life. And even though I was in a place where my flesh was out of control, the years of investment into my spirit paid dividends that I am so grateful for today. And maybe some of you are here today, you've had those situations where things were just kind of tracking, veering off course in your life. And, and all of a sudden, you just knew that you knew that you knew that, oh, I got to stop this. I can't go this direction. I've got to, to fix this. I, I can't see this person. I can't do this task. And, and maybe you haven't. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus today. Uh, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to have a relationship with him and an opportunity to get your spirit made alive again so that your spirit can guide you into the right place and that the enemy within won't have a hold on you. So I want to talk to you under the title, Strengthening Your Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, Strengthen. Turn to your second choice and say, Your Spirit. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit, capital S, through the Holy Spirit, in the inner man or the inner person. God wants to play an active role in your spirit being strengthened. Now, God made you spirit, soul, and body. He understands how you are wired, and he understands that you're in a fallen world, that your flesh has desires and that your soul has some brokenness in it. And because of that, God has made a way through Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit to strengthen the real you so that the real you is able to dictate your life, not the flesh side of you. But in order to, to strengthen our spirit, we, we kind of have to understand a little bit about how God set all of this in motion. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus today, maybe you're watching online and you found a, a link on, on YouTube or something like that, L listen to me very closely. You were born into a broken and fallen world, and the father of all humanity, Adam, and the mother of all humanity, Eve, they sinned. And when they sinned, their soul uh, was darkened. Their flesh appetites were unleashed and their spirit became dead. When God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. They assumed he meant physically. But the promise was that if you eat from this tree, your spirit will die. Because they, tr they committed treason against God. So God, at, at that moment, he began to put the plan of redemption in place that throughout the ages and eons and throughout history that God was working a plan to, to, to bring a sacrifice to pay for the sin of Adam and Eve so that the spirit, the individual spirit of each and every person on planet earth could be revived, could be strengthened, could be uh, rebuilt 
If you're a believer today, Jesus made your spirit alive at the second of salvation, but now you take on the ownership and task of rebuilding and strengthening what was broken. So there's hope. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 and 27. It says this, uh, it's a prophecy. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your iniquity and from all of your idols. Idols are just simply things that you place in your heart that take the place of God in your heart. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. In the original Hebrew, when he says a new heart, it's talking about your soul. When he says he'll put a new spirit in you, he's literally talking about your spirit, the spirit that was born into this earth, this broken, fallen world that was dead, a dead spirit. He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit, capital S, in you, the Holy Spirit in you, and move you to follow my decrees. So be careful to keep my laws. And then verse 33, skip down just a little bit. This is what the sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all of your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. Now, this has meaning in two time periods. It, it has meaning in the day when God spoke it to the people of Israel that he would cleanse them. And when they were cleansed from their idols and their sin, and they were looking forward to this Messiah, Jesus, that when that day happens, that, that also he would begin to rebuild the cities. But metaphorically speaking, this also is applicable to us today. That's why the wording is on that one day. That one day prophetically is talking about the day that Jesus hung on the cross and died for the sin of humanity. So look at me very closely. There's two things that happen in the life of every person. There's the, the revival of your spirit, the renewal of your spirit, but then the rebuilding of the ruins. And you know this, like when you first got born again, those of you who are followers of Jesus, it's like, you know, we call those folks like on fire, like they're on fire for God. And then everybody who's been serving God for five years, they're like, hey man, just slow down just a little bit. And I'm like, shut up, leave him alone. Let him burn bright. As long as he'll burn, just let him go. But at some point you've got to figure out how to kindle the flame on your own. And at some point you find out that this thing that Jesus did on the inside of you that you're so excited about that's just driving life, all of a sudden the reality of the brokenness starts to set in. And the reality of the weakness of our spirit, even though it has been made alive, begins to set in and the rebuilding process happens. And at some point, if you're a follower of God, you figure out, hey, wait a minute, no, I've got to change some friends i got to change some influences. I've got to change some things that I do. I, I've got to begin to read the scripture. I've got to begin to study this. I actually need to begin to pray. I need to figure out a few of these things in order to strengthen my spirit. Otherwise, you'll live a life as a believer that is completely controlled by the enemy. So how do we partner with God to strengthen our spirit? How do we do that? If God wants to strengthen you by his spirit, strengthen your spirit by his spirit on the inner man, how do you link arms together with God? And how do you actually make that happen in a, in a very practical way? At the moment that God has revived your spirit and made it alive, how do you then take something that is alive and make it strong? In Isaiah chapter 58... Verse 12, it says this, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the old, age old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls and the restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, principally, for us, it was legalistically for them, 
If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it not by going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If you don't walk away with anything else from today, I want you to understand this, that one of those principles that feeds through the Old Testament into the New Testament is the idea of a Sabbath. Just like tithing is pre-law and post-law. Now, the Sabbath was instituted in the law, but it was also instituted when God created the heavens and earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh. So principally, the way that God has designed this plan of redemption for us to to build our spirit happens in this umbrella of something called a Sabbath principle. A Sabbath principle. Now, it doesn't matter what day you practice the Sabbath principle. And and, and you got to look at me and listen to me. This is not a legalistic thing. This is a, a licensed thing. This is a freedom for you to engage yourself in everything that God has to offer to, to build your spirit up so that you can be strong and full of purpose and make a difference. And that when you take your last breath on planet Earth, that you've got to grin from ear to ear and your tongue is hanging out because you know that there are going to be people in eternity because you strengthened your spirit, and you changed the world. It's a Sabbath principle. Jesus rose on Sunday, so the early Christians made the first day of the week a Sabbath. They celebrated it. We see it throughout Scripture. I read it in this morning's uh, tithe and offering on the first day of the week. Set something aside. It's when it, it changed. Now, don't get legalistic or ritualistic or religious with it. I want you to understand the principle behind it. That we honor this Sabbath and that the activities that exist within a Sabbath day are important. Most of our issues would be taken care of in life, the enemy that, that comes out to attack us from within. Most of our issues would be taken care of in life if we just put some intentionality around a day dedicated to God for rest and for worship. I love it. Jim McGuire, who is one of our uh, volunteer staff, he runs Coffee Bar and Ushers, and what does Jim not run? I get a text from Jim all the time, and he and Amy are sitting up. I just see toes in the weekend service on on the the flat screen against the wall. And on Sunday evenings or Monday evenings, Jim and Amy, they go home and they have their worship time because they're here making a difference to services every single weekend. And it's a principle to them to be invested in. Think about how strengthened your spirit becomes if you begin to tithe that day, one day a week, to God. Well, I don't have time for that. Well, we all have the same 168 hours in a week. And on average, we spend about 24 hours a week watching Netflix. Uh, On average, we spend 16.9 hours a week scrolling on social media. Which, by the way, a tithe of your 168 hours is 16.8 hours, which is typically one day minus your sleep. There's something to this idea of a a time that you set aside for God where there are principles at play where you can rest and worship and serve and make a difference. And, and, And if we're being honest, I think we as a generation have allowed our day of worship to God to be invaded by everything else but God. And we kind of, I'm not mad at you because you guys are the ones that are here and you guys are the ones that are watching. But I know some of you, which by the way, can we just give it up to everybody who's here all the time, dream team and serving every single weekend. I'm not so much talking to you right now as to the person who's working out their faith. So hear me very closely. We've allowed a lot of things to to move into our lives that have pushed out the thing that causes our life to have the most success and satisfaction. 
And it is to give the first of that week to God. And to give the first of that week to the things that are contained in a worship day. To make them a priority. And in some ways, we have reduced our investment in our own spirituality down to 65 or 70 minutes on a Sunday morning. And maybe a few minutes throughout the week reading our Bibles or or praying. When principally... I see that there is a day that's set aside for you and your family and your friends and your worship and your Bible study and your prayer and rest. To kick back and watch some football with the family, to to cook a great meal to go to church and worship together and, and just get full of God, to get a word that you can, you can just chew on all week long, to, to be in a worship service with, with the corporate gathering and, and experience the presence of God and then take that all week long. And my concern is, is that our generation, the past three generations really, we, we have lost the idea of a Sabbath principle and the, the profound nature of what that principle does in us and through us. The average, and I'm not mad at you, just this, the statistics, the average attendance for a church-going person in church is 10 times a year. It's less than once a month. I don't say that to shame you. I just say that because I think it's a sobering statistic that some of the trend lines for those of us who are following God are heading the wrong direction. And at some point, somebody has to to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, we probably need to recenter and refocus this because I'm doing the counseling with a lot of you guys. And and I know and I see the things that are out of whack. And and I'm like, man, 99% of the issues that most of us face would just be dealt with if, if we would just dedicate a day to God. We can dedicate 24 hours a week to TV and 16 to social media. I think we can find some time. And, and look at me very closely. If you find that time, if you make that time, if you prioritize that time, you will find that the other uh, hours of your week are so much better. I was, I was talking to some, uh, some of our uh, young millennials and um, you know, I, I love millennials. We have some great millennials. Shannon, who runs broadcast. Pastor Frank's a millennial. I mean, so many great young millennials. How many millennials I have in the house? You're afraid to raise your hand. <laughs> Zach and Bonnie, I mean, leading the Emerge and, and Next Steps. I mean, so, so many great millennials. I was talking to some of our young millennials, and, and I'm trying to, to, to help and, and, and just encourage. And, and I had a few young millennials that came. They're like, man, I don't know, Pastor Ben, like I just not feeling it anymore. And I went to this other church. I felt the spirit moving, and I was like, wow, that's great. I'm so glad. And, and, and so we're kind of having this, this whole conversation. And, um, and I'm trying to pastor these guys through this. And, and here's the pattern that I've noticed is a lot of young millennials are so um, they have such a, a justice uh, gear to, to make a difference in the world. Like, we want to make a difference. And a lot of young millennials and Gen Zers, they, 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 they really do want to serve. They'll go on long mission trips, and they'll serve at church, and they'll play on the worship team. They'll do all kinds of stuff, and they'll give and give and give. But what I'm noticing in the next generations is, is we have this gear to make a difference and change the world, but we've lost the gear to dedicate a Sabbath to God. And in all these millennials that I was talking to, the same thing. And I told them this. I said, guys, if you would just come to church on the weekends that you're not scheduled to serve, you would meet the Holy Spirit here too. You just went to another place on a day that you're not serving. Of course you're going to connect with the Holy Spirit. And I think it's a big trap that that some of our younger generations are getting into. And I want to encourage you, just bloom where you're planted. You don't have to go someplace else to get it. And here's my other thing is I was kind of offended by it because, you know, the church is like my baby. I'm like, don't, don't talk about my baby. <laughs> Pour my life into this thing. But I was offended for you guys because I'm like, well, what about the other hundreds of people that show up and God just does something in their life every single weekend? Wow. 
Now, I'm no longer a research chemist, but I remember enough to know that if the majority of the data says one thing and there's an outlier, that usually the problem is with the outlier. And I just want to encourage you, if you're feeling that, that weakness on the inside, then, then don't make anybody else your problem. Don't, don't blame anybody else or don't blame the too much haze on the stage or the, the subs don't thump loud enough or whatever. Don't, don't blame it on that. Understand that, that the strength of your spirit is directly proportional to the investment that you've placed in it. Um, there, there's a guy in the church, uh, a millennial, and... Um, and uh, he and I have, were having coffee, and he was telling me, you know, he spent, you know, 10 years in Nashville trying to, 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 to follow his purpose and plan, and, and, and they moved back here, and they've got history here, heritage here, and, and um, you know, they, they'd been here for a while, and they were just kind of getting disgruntled, and they're like, no, we got to go back to Nashville, nothing's happening here, and, and he told me, they said, the Lord told him, no, you stay here, bloom where you're planted. Stay here, stay here, stay here. But God, it's not Nashville. How can I make it big in a place that's not Nashville? I got to go back to Nashville. I need to be back in Nashville. And the Lord said, no, just stay here. And as soon as he settled it in his heart, and he said, you know what? I'm just going to worship God here. I'm going to invest here. I'm going to invest in my family. He started getting crazy contracts. He wrote the Christmas song for Gwen, Gwen Stefani for this year. He just got a contract to write the single for uh, One Republic's new release. In, in Jupiter, Florida. He didn't need to be in, in Nashville. He needed to be where God told him to be. The principle of the Sabbath was designed by God as a way, a means to strengthen your soul. We've got to watch our schedule. You can't keep your pedal to the metal and expect to stay strong. You can't continually just work, 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 and not invest in your spirit. So let me give you in the next couple minutes that I have with you some pretty key things. You probably already know what these are. I think it was Albert Einstein said this, we don't need more education, we just need to execute on the things we already know. And I find that to be very true with us in life and church. Pray don't need anything deep. As a matter of fact, if you're drowning in life, the last thing you need is deep. So these are, are pretty common things that, that I believe God just wants to, to, to reintroduce to you from a Sabbath principle and encourage you to make sure that you're doing these. The first one is to invest in the study of God's word. To invest in the study of God's word. So 1 Peter 2, verses 2 through 5 says this, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. How many of y'all have babies or you had babies and you discovered the magic that is milk in a bottle? I mean, meltdown mode, can't go to sleep, whatever it is, a bottle just does everything, does it not? It solves everything. Why? Because when the baby gets hungry, their desire for that milk is so strong. This is the picture that God's trying to create. So before you turn me off and say, ah, oh, yeah, I read my scriptures. Ah, oh, yeah, I do this. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what, what God's trying to get to you is that to strengthen your soul, it can't just be a religious thing that you do, but to get yourself to the place where your desire for the scriptures is like a baby desiring a bottle. For your hunger for the word of God and revelation is an unsatiable and unquenchable desire and hunger on the inside of you that you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to open the Bible. You come to church, you can't wait to hear what the key text is for the weekend, that you can't wait to show up at Romans or your life group or whatever you're doing to dig in and get some, some food, some soul food for your spirit, that, that, that you desire that sincere milk, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, you've been made new, revived. Verse 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is the, the answer to the prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament about I will put a new heart in you. I'll take out the stony heart and put in a flesh heart. I'm going to revive your spirit and I'm going to rebuild the ruins. And we see it come through into the New Testament that as we desire the word of God, that we understand that God is gracious. That's our, our spiritual revival and renewal. That's salvation. But then he goes on verse five, but you as living stones. And when he talked about he wants to rebuild the ruins in the Old Testament, the way that it applies to you today is that he wants to rebuild you 
as a living stone, that you become a spiritual house to God, that you become a, a movement of God. And these days, every single one of us is important. Every single living stone fits together in this thing called the kingdom of God, in this modern day ecclesia church, the gathering of the called out ones. We study the word of God. How many of you guys, you'd like to have deeper friendships just in life? Yeah, thanks for being vulnerable. How many of you guys feel ill-equipped to parent from time to time? How many of you guys have had marriage struggles? How many of you guys are completely lying in church right now on all those questions? <laughs> Did you know that the answers, the, the, the food that you need for your soul, those things happen in small groups? Those answers are happening, and this is, this is why a, 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 a Sabbath principle is, is so vital and important that it's not just reduced down to 65 minutes on a Sunday morning, that, that there is a dedicated tithe of your time to God. Now, I know God is a redeemer of time, and I'm not saying legalistically you've got to spend 16.8 hours a week, uh, you know, investing in your spirit. God will do more with less. He always does. But what I am saying is that the current trajectory of our generations is not in an increasing investment into our spirit. It's in a decreasing investment into our spirit. And just as a pastor, you know, the, the, the shepherds had a hook on the end of their, their uh, staff. The, the reason for that hook was so they could pull the sheep back around on, on path. I, I don't want to pull us around on, on path. Well, Pastor Ben, I can't, I can't desire the sincere. I can't learn the scriptures. I can't memorize those. Well, you memorize the songs to all your favorite artists. Maybe you're just spending more time memorizing other stuff. If you put the word of God in you and you don't need it, guess what happens? It comes out when you do. And I'll take it even just a step further. James would go on in, in chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 to tell us that we must not just be hearers of the word, but actually we must be doers of the word. I'm getting deep. Taking you where you don't want to go. Don't just hear it, but act, apply it in life. The second thing is this, to invest into your spirit, to partner with God, to invest in your spirit, is invest in a deep prayer life. Invest in a deep prayer life. i got to be honest, prayer for me was one of those things that I just struggled with. It was actually worship that opened the, the floodgates for prayer for me. It was in that moment of worship that my relationship with God began to develop in prayer. But Jesus said this in Matthew 26, verse 40. He came to the disciples and he found them sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And then Jesus makes this statement. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your spirit wants to pray, but your flesh can get in the way. And, and the way that you overcome that is you have to develop a hunger for prayer. You have to develop a, a the discipline around prayer. And what happens is, it's like with any relationship, the more you spend time with that person in conversation, the more you find out about them, the, the deeper it gets, the better you like them, the, the better the relationship begins to blossom. The same thing happens with God. And, and I think in our, our crazy, busy, social media-driven world today, it's so hard to spend time with God in deep prayer because we're scrolling to see what's happening in the depths of other people's lives. Lives. Who had a party? Who had some kind of meal that they thought was worthy of snapping a photo? I could care less what you ate. I want to know what God wants to feed me. A deep prayer life. The third thing is this invest in worshiping Him. Invest in worshiping Him. Romans 12, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I just want to say a couple words around worship. Worship is not just the buffer that gets us into the sermon for the weekend. And I'm not mad at us, but I do want to help pastor us. This, the, the corporate gathering of worship is, is, is like nothing you can get anyplace else. 
the move of the Spirit in this place where we're gathered together, I discovered Jesus in worship. It's where I felt his presence and was in those places of, of being in God's presence that I was like, hey, wait a minute, I want to know more about you. I want to talk to you. And I can't encourage you enough to prioritize the corporate worship because where two or more are gathered, his presence is there. And there's so much to worship. I need to do a whole series on worship. But, but let, me, let me just, oh gosh, I don't even know. Psalm 69 verse 30. <laughs> I will, I will praise the name of God. I will worship the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Look at me. If you don't get anything else about worship, worship is a place where you magnify God. What does that mean? It means that God in most of our lives is a distant speck like a star 200 million light years away. And when we worship him, the Bible says that we magnify him. And when you are in worship and you're magnifying God, you're bringing the image of God closer and closer. You're making him, it's like grab your phone and just, just take your fingers and come out and zoom in on Jesus. And I can't tell you how much it will do for your spirit development to, to, to zoom in on Jesus, to, to magnify him and just get a, an up close view. Because when you magnify him, it minimizes everything else in your life. That's just drawing you away. And then the fourth one I want you to write down is invest in right relationships. Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, this is what happens in the Sabbath principle. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance of faith, uh, that it brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us. I love the language. It's Old Testament pulled right into the New Testament. Sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience, having our body washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful, verse 24. And now let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. When, when he talks about having your heart sprinkled, that's salvation. That's the revival, the renewal side. The, the rebuilding side of how you build your spirit up is the gathering together of saints. I wish I could unpack this for you. In every one of these scriptures, it applies to the spirit that is saved and then the spirit that is developed, that is built and Luke, Jesus would, would have this, this moment where he stands in the temple and he pulls up the, the book of Isaiah and he reads from Isaiah. He's quoting from Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from the darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise and worship instead of the spirit of despair. Those are all elements of God reviving our spirit. Then they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Verse four, and they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Some of us are here today and we've been revived in our spirit, but we need to be rebuilt. Our spirit has been made alive, but the investment needs to be made to rebuild the ruins, to make our spirit stronger than our flesh, to make our spirit stronger than our, our, our mind and our soul, our will and our emotions, to, to strengthen the real part of who we are, the eternal part. God's will is to revive your spirit and to rebuild you. Listen to this last verse, Proverbs 25, 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls.